I hope you are all doing exceptionally well. We are now on our way to yet another autocross race to put the old 1986 Porsche 944 up to the test, Project Weekend Racer. We've got it loaded up in the trailer back there. We are on our way to the Fortress, which is a autocross venue. Well, it's actually a sports complex, but they have a big parking lot and they hold a lot of autocross races it's on the south side of Columbus. Now, this is only the second time we've put this car to the test. First time, well, Things went well. It drove all of the 16 runs that we put it through between myself and my bro Mitchell, but it was not the most competitive. We did a couple major things to the car to hopefully bring this thing up to snuff and give it more of a competitive edge. The main one of those things being tires. We put brand new tires on it that are actually fairly sticky and right at the minimum tread wear level that you're allowed to run in the street class. And then we also changed the front sway bar bushings to make them much, much more stiff which the car needed terribly. It rolled so badly in the corners. So now between those two items that we did to this thing, it is a completely different animal and handles so, so much better. Amazing. And I'm very excited to see how it stacks up now against the competition. Obviously horsepower wise, we're the same as before, but handling wise, we are much, much improved. So I've got a little bit more driving to do. I'm gonna go ahead and do that. And uh, we will talk soon once we're at the fortress. Well, hey kids, let's go ahead and do a quick course overview. So here is a map actually provided by the race organizer uh, for what this course looks like. Kind of cool. Going into the actual thing, we could actually see, you know, what the course was uh, going to be like that we were actually going to be uh, running. So anyway, right away, you can tell there's a huge, huge difference between just the style of track uh, between this one and then the one that we did at Kill Care. Uh, so you can see at the bottom right here is the starting line. We start off, we do a uh, tighter than it looks left hander through the crossover for the first time uh, into a right hander mini little kink into a sharp 90 degree right hander which then flows into the second straight basically then this here this feature right here is, is make or break for the lap basically it was a quick right left hander it was very very easy to clip one of these cones but that also you know, as you can see here, sets you up on the outside of this uh, little little straight section, which is the inside of the final corner before the finish line. So, you know, it's something that you need to push hard through, but then it can completely screw up your setup um, going into the final corner. Again, this this basically area right here was, was absolutely make or break. So you can see in general, this course is much more open, much more flowy, does not incorporate nearly as many features. Uh, in fact, it incorporates zero slalom features, um, which is a huge difference compared to uh, what we saw at Kill Care, obviously, which was basically made up of nothing but slalom features. It's kind of like a shrunken down road course for the most part. Anyway, that is the track layout and a little bit of uh, compare and contrast with what we experienced at Kill Care. Uh, let's go ahead and get into the actual runs, shall we? What? Wow. Just pulling up to grid now. So I'm pretty freaking psyched because yeah, this track is a much, much more open and flowy course than what Kill Care was. Kill Care being much more tight and technical. This track is much more like a shrunken down road course. Uh, I think it'll be much better suited to um, the 944 overall, uh, but I guess we will see. Also, look how dope this 987.2 Cayman is, just saying. Alrighty, well, I'm gonna keep uh, falling in line here and uh, see you during the first run.
the track that time because I'm like 93% sure I didn't hit any cones. Decent, I don't know, nice to see improvement and by a second and a half almost. All right, well, got some stuff to build on for uh, round three. I think we have uh, definitely more uh, room to grow for sure. All right, here we go. Run three, run three. I'm trying to do a lot to uh, take some meat off the tail. And in that first corner, I think I can stay flat out. Go.
run too so can't be too mad i guess yeah i definitely am picked up time i would say in that first big right hander second right hander lost some time overcooked it by uh by a little bit for sure nonetheless uh an improvement overall so can't be that mad I was trying to do that thing, like that guy, you know, where he just throws the chair out and sits down. It's harder than it looks. Well, here we are with the second edition of the Fun Ahead TV podcast. Still working titles going on, but this is Between Two Posts. <laughs> and I need my laptop. <sighs> All right, so the Between Two Posts topics of discussion for this particular podcast. We're going to cover the car's performance now versus before we did the modifications. This track, meaning the Fortress versus Kill Care. And then finally, how did the 944 do this time around? Not just from a performance perspective, but how did it stack up against the competition? Which is probably something that you're all wondering, including myself. All right, so running down the list here, car's performance now versus previously at the last autocross. Now, to be clear, we did two uh, major performance upgrades uh, between now and the last time. If you missed that video, please go back and watch it. We talk about that in depth. Uh, but basically, we put new tires on the car, Hankook hand Ventus RS4 tires, and we did the PowerFlex race bushings uh, on the front sway bar, both of which made a massive difference. Honestly, it, it transformed the car. The lateral grip was definitely vastly improved thanks to the tires. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't feel the body roll benefit as much on this particular course because uh, there weren't really any, you know, repetitive slalom features. Um, there was just the one little right left juke at the end right before the final corner. Nonetheless, I know there was certainly a benefit. I mean, you could just feel it on turn in the, the, the quickness with which the nose begins changing direction uh, with the car now is vastly different than what it was previously. So kind of on that topic, uh, that brings me to how was this track versus Kill Care? So the Kill Care track was designed by a Miata guy. And as we saw in the uh, first race video, it was a tight course and it was very slalom heavy. Basically it was just a series of slums. This particular course was not that, it was basically just like a big uh, ribbon basically strung together and it was wide open with the exception of at the end of the second big straightaway You had the right left little juke there uh, Before the final corner which was which was a fun feature because you really had to set that up nicely um, And therefore it could make or break your entire lap if you didn't set that up nicely You were screwed for the final corner as well uh, this track even though it was a little shorter I think was a lot more open in general uh, wider like more use of of track um, and then also uh, just yeah less features in general uh, more flowy more like a shrunken down road course so definitely comes along with its pros and cons one thing I, that kind of surprised me though is i was expecting to like the fortress a lot more just when i saw the initial track layout in the email that came out the night before the big uh the actual event i was like this is going to be sweet but what i realized is that um more open courses with less features are more forgiving from a driving standpoint um meaning that in the end uh it really did benefit uh higher horsepower cars and you really didn't have to be you know a super calculated good finesse driver if you had more power then it it benefited you a lot more and we'll see that and talk about that in more detail uh, when we look at the results of actually how this race went but there were of course exceptions uh, there were some drivers in lower horsepower car cars that were able to place very well in this event as well and we will talk about that um, as we get into the results which brings me to the results so how did the 944 do this time around? So they divided the street class up into three sections, which is a little bit different than what they did in the Kill Care race. They put everyone together in the Kill Care race. This one was street all-wheel drive, street front-wheel drive, street rear-wheel drive. Obviously, we were street rear-wheel drive. So in street rear-wheel drive, I placed 18th out of 31. The front 58% of the field. Um, combining all of the street class together, I was 29th out of 48 drivers. So I was top 60% of the field there in overall. I was initially pretty disappointed with this result. Um, I honestly you know, felt like, at least from a driving standpoint, that I was driving 
pretty well. Um, and the car was handling so much better than what it was previously. And I felt very confident in the car's abilities um, as opposed to at the first event with the softer sway bar bushings and really crappy tires. There was a lot of ambiguity from a driving standpoint, a lot of lack of confidence overall as far as what the car was going to do. That being said, uh, I spent a lot of time uh, looking at the results afterwards and really, really studying them. And I realized when I looked down the list that actually all of the cars that placed ahead of me were either quite high horsepower cars. We're talking like C7 Corvettes, BMW M2s, like Porsche Cayman S's or new 718 Caymans. You know, so you have these like really uh, either higher horsepower and good handling cars or GR86s. Those are just an anomaly and they, they just, regardless of horsepower, they just excel at the, in the autocross environment. The field is supposed to be kind of leveled by the index uh, that is utilized within autocross. And, and this is, okay, to preface, I'm not trying to use this as an excuse. You know, I performed where I did. It is what it is what it is. Um, but I, I decided to go ahead and graph out this data and just see what it looked like graphically, the index time. Of course, the raw times, you know, you would expect a faster, higher horsepower car to have a better raw time, especially on a more wide open track where it can really let the ponies out, you know. I graphed it out by index time on the y-axis versus vehicle horsepower on the x-axis so i found that i found that very interesting that there's a there's a definite downward trend or downward slope um, as far as you know the increase in horsepower uh, still results in a a better overall time but it makes sense when you consider that this track didn't really have many features where it would come down to the driver it would be more so like you know more so forgiving like i said and allow cars with uh, more speed potential uh, to to benefit Again, not an excuse, but what I'm saying is, I mean, th this, this data is excluding novices. So everyone basically knows what we're doing for the most part. And interestingly enough, I went ahead and did the same thing for the street class from the race at Killcare a few weeks back, and you see a completely flat trend. And of course, at that track, it was very tight, very technical, very um, dependent on the driver and less so on the car, much more of a level playing field when you consider um, the PAX times, you know, even for a C7 Corvette versus a base Ford Focus. Even though there was a clear trend, a downward trend with regards to horsepower, obviously there are exceptions in there. When you look at the GR86s slash BRZs, like I said, those are an absolute anomaly uh, and they're just such track weapons with regards to autocross uh, and they obviously can do very well regardless of the fact that they only have low 200 horsepower. They can go up against the C7 Corvette and do just fine. So that means I just need to do better, which leads me to my next point, And that is I'm not trying to make excuses at all for my own performance. In fact, it's exactly the opposite. And nor am I saying that we all need to go out and buy C7 Corvettes in order to do well at an autocross event. What I'm saying is this simply illustrates that different cars are more conducive for different track environments, um, even with the index. And I love how the 944 poses its own challenges. It's an absolute underdog, uh, being that this thing is 40 years old and going up against these much, much newer performance cars. So it becomes more down to the driver uh, to make the thing do well. Uh, and same goes for the Miata drivers. It's an absolute momentum car, uh, just like the Miatas, uh, and requires skill to do well, which is why at the beginning of the project, I mentioned that I'm coming for the Miatas and the BRZs. And Based on the results that we just saw at the Fortress, well, we've already come for the Miatas, and I happen to beat out every single Miata in the street class, which I take that as a big win. And in the Miata list, there was an NA, an NB, and an ND, all of which were behind me when you consider PAX times. And there was one BRZ as well. Hey. So all of that being said, this gives me something to strive for, regardless of track layout, features, not features, you know, track style. If we can make this 150 horsepower, 40 year old girl competitive with the GR86, then I will be absolutely thrilled. We're soon going back to kill care with our performance upgrades, of course. We're not gonna like revert back to the old stuff. So even though we're only top 60% of the field on this big wide open course at the Fortress, it'll be interesting to see how we do when we go back to kill care uh, where the higher horsepower cars do, do not benefit as much. And for that, we'll have to wait a few more weeks because we're going back with our performance upgrades. 
Anyway, in conclusion, another successful autocross with the 944 is in the books. Uh, we definitely improved relative to the rest of the field. Uh, in fact, comparing PAX times across all of the attendees, we were 58th out of 141 people. Now, that sounds awesome, but 41 of which were novice drivers. So excluding them, we're, well, right back where we started in the top 58%. Sort of funny how that works out. So aside from achieving part of our goal at this autocross uh, of dethroning the mighty Miatas, I learned something pretty important. As fun as autocross is, it is much more important when you do it with a friend. I know that sounds corny, but it's so true. Unfortunately, Mitchell wasn't able to go along with me this time around, uh, and it just wasn't the same. I would say half the fun is the camaraderie of the whole thing, strategizing, talking line choice, and, and you're, when you're both running in the same car, uh, discussing how your car is doing uh, on track and riding with each other in the car, just working together as a team almost, even though you're, you're technically uh, competitors. But fortunately, Mitchell and I are going to be uh, hitting the track together again very soon. Uh, and I think he is going to be amazed with how much differently this car handles now as opposed to when he first drove it. So with that, I think we'll just go ahead and uh, end this episode between the two posts. <laughs> I appreciate each and every one of you for being here. If you enjoyed this video, please do me a huge favor and hit that like button. It helps out my channel significantly. And please subscribe. Statistically speaking, most of you guys that watch these videos aren't even subscribed to my channel. It's free, it's super easy to do, and it means you get to watch even more content like this whenever it goes live. So please subscribe. So thank you all so much for being here. I appreciate each and every one of you. Yes, you, I'm looking right at you. And I will see you all in the next video. See ya. Thanks so much for watching that video. If you want to see even more great fun ahead TV content, please click the link right here. I'll see you over there.